Welcome to Capital View, where we discuss the latest in Illinois state government and politics. I'm Hannah Meisel with NPR Illinois. Joining us this week is Kent Redfield, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Illinois Springfield. Thanks for being here, Kent. Good to be here. And also here is John O'Connor, political writer with the Associated Press. Glad you're here, John. Always a pleasure, Hannah. Well, another unpredictable week of uh, veto session in Springfield. Always interesting uh, to kind of gauge where lawmakers are at with their priorities. Um, you know, when we are in a kind of fall session, I mean, especially after the summer that we've had with on and off session and negotiations over the energy bill. Um, but lawmakers had a lot on their plate this week, especially after getting almost nothing done in their first week of theater session. So John, um, you know, ostensibly uh, lawmakers uh, first priority was going to be passing a congressional map, but it looks like that effort is stalled. Um, it looks like intraparty fighting among Democrats has, um, you know, led to this outcome where we might not actually see a congressional map until uh, January, which runs up very close to when uh, would-be candidates are going to start filing petitions uh, in on January 13th, I believe it is. So how did we get here? Well, it's, it's um, uh, I remember a, a couple of uh, Januarys ago at the, at the start of, I believe, the last uh, biennial session, um, when uh, Democrats had, had won super majorities once again in both the House and Senate. And, and uh, I was speaking to a group of uh, school superintendents and I said, uh, the, the good news for Democrats is that they have super majorities in both chambers. The bad news from Democrats is that they have super majorities in both chambers. Uh, this is a, uh, just a simple case of um, so much power consolidated among, um, you know, a, a political caucus in in one state, and a state that has uh, such a huge diversity in terms of geography. You know, we've talked about um, the the northern part of the state being north of Boston, and the and the southern part of the state being south of Richmond, and and the and the cultural differences that go in with that. So you're going to have um, a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, bashing of heads, inter inter party bashing of heads, if you will. Oh sure, I mean, this is when you are when you're not really uh, fighting the other party because you have kind of made them a non-entity. Uh, you know, there probably gets to be a point where. Uh, you have made your own caucus so large. You know, this is true in, you know, every sort of group. It's like herding cats, but it's um, it's very interesting um, to see the dynamic how, you know, it was under former House Speaker Mike Madigan that the last uh, group of uh, legislators were elected um, and Democrats lost uh, one in their supermajority in uh, last November. But you know, it's been really interesting to see the difference in management from former House Speaker Madigan and uh, current House Speaker uh, Chris Welch. So, Ken, are you are you at all surprised that um, after you know being able to stay relatively together on uh, legislative maps, not once but twice uh, this year, uh, despite you know. Uh, a lot of court challenges. Are you are you at all surprised that it was the congressional map that uh, kind of held up the caucus? Well, this is when you're drawing legislative maps for you know House and Senate districts. You know you've got 59 Senate districts, uh, 118 House districts. You've got a lot of move, room to maneuver. We're going from 18 congressional districts to 17 congressional districts in a state that's had some pretty dramatic uh, population demographic changes. Now, not as great in the last decade as the decade before, but still significant. And so, uh, you know, this is a, a fight primarily in Northeastern Illinois, uh, that the downstate portion of the map seems to be pretty set. 
That's just strict partisan politics in Northeastern Illinois. We're wrestling with, you know, we've got 11 Democratic districts up there. How do we reelect 11 Democrats? But then we have questions of diversity, particularly Hispanic representation, where not only you have ambitious people, which we have conflicts between, uh, you know, the white, Hispanic and black legislators and constituents, uh, but you also have the threat of litigation. Uh, one of the things, the few things you can sue a, sue a map over is uh, diminishing uh, uh, voting rights of racial minorities. And so uh, everybody's got leverage at this point. And, and we went from one Hispanic lean, you know, district to one Hispanic and one strongly leaning Hispanic district. Uh, obviously, some people want more. Uh, and then this gets tied up in the numbers, right? The Illinois Constitution, right now, you need a three-fifths vote for an immediate effective date, or it goes all the way to July, which means uh, that you couldn't, you know, that would make the map irrelevant. Uh, but once we get into that magic window, after the 1st of January, before we get the new General Assembly, you can do things with 60 and 30. So the people that are trying to leverage the map have to decide, you know, where's my maximum leverage? Uh, you know, can I get something done now? Or if I ask for two month, too much, uh, you know, there's certainly 60 votes to pass that map. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's probably going to be a very interesting day or maybe two days, uh, you know, to see what uh, you know what what what's going to happen. So uh, uh, it is, you know, we're we're somebody's odd man out in this, uh, uh, and 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 it's not just uh, in terms of getting rid of a Republican in the redistricting, but it's also you know if you've got two Hispanic districts up in northeastern Illinois, then you've got two incumbents somewhere that are going to have to uh, probably run against each other. And so uh, it's an interesting dilemma. Right. And, you know, I, as you mentioned, yeah, we you do have to uh, make some decisions somewhere. And it's in the three drafts that uh, Democrats have unveiled in the last couple of weeks. John, um, you know, uh, Congresswoman Marie Newman, she's a freshman who, you know, she ran twice. She uh, she beat uh, Dan Lipinski um, after uh, losing to him narrowly uh, in 2018. You know, she and her progressive creds. You know, she has gotten uh, kind of a lot of notoriety already um, in her. You know, not even a year in Washington, but um, it's under the first map that Democrats unveiled. Uh, uh, her district was made a lot more rural and white by extending it all the way west to Starved Rock. And under the uh, the subsequent two um, drafts that uh, the party has, um, you know, unveiled, it, it, she and Sean Caston, um, another fairly new uh, Democrat who, um, you know, kind of beat the map in the 2018 blue wave and throwing out a uh, long time uh, Congressman Peter Roskam in that sixth district, um, they those two would have to run uh, against each other uh, under these maps uh, for, you know, for the sake of adding that second uh, Latino uh, influenced voting population district in uh, the city's suburbs. So, you know, John, do you think that uh, Marie Newman has uh, much influence here, or do you think that you know? It's just the luck of the draw and last one in, first one out, kind of a principle of a lot of workplaces. Well, as Ken and I were discussing off air, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a, a um, uh, uh, what's, what's the term, a, a, a wealth, you know, a, a, an abundance of, of wealth among the Democrats. I'm sure Illinois Democrats wish they could export Sean Cast and Marie Newman to Indiana or Missouri. Um, uh, to help um, the House on on Capitol Hill, it but it comes down to um, uh, we were talking about the the um, we have you know Sean Cast and Marie Newman. You're you're our favorites. It's just that we have four or five favorites 
<laughs> favorite ahead of you. Um, and uh, I, I would think that given her record, um, she would have some influence within the party, but it is kind of, it's still, you know, there still is uh, uh, a machine aspect to the Democratic Party. There is still um, uh, a, a we don't want nobody, uh, we don't want nobody, nobody sent uh, kind of mentality that that if you're, um, that, that loyalty is going to um, uh, play a big hand. Um, and, it, you know, the, the, um, and there and there may be people in the in the party who are still upset that Dan Lipinski lost. You know, he was one of the he he and his father before him were both um, you know party regulars. So there's a lot of that uh, being figured in. Um, on the other hand, Marie Newman would not be the first to um, have a vastly different district than she was first elected in, and many people before her have shown their mettle, you know, by surviving in a, in a vastly different district than they initially. So it, it comes down to, you know, um, the, the rough and tumble of politics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ken, uh, before we move on from this, we do have a lot to talk about uh, aside from that, but uh, creating this second Latino influenced uh, congressional district, this is something that, uh, Folks, you know, in the mold of uh, Congressman uh, Jesus Chiri Garcia have agitated for for years. And, you know, they have put in a lot of work uh, ahead of the 2020 census and getting, uh, you know, their communities to answer the census and, it's you know, to show. And, you know, it's like we've said on the show many times, it's not just the story in Illinois, but it's the story everywhere of growing Latino populations. And so... If, um, you know, if, if uh, Latinos and uh, progressives, too, if you uh, want to highlight, you know, that arrangement between the two, if they give up on this, I mean, I guess, I guess my question really is, do you see uh, Trey Garcia giving up on this? I mean, I, it also brings to mind that during the end of Madigan's tenure as House Speaker, um, he and Trey Garcia, not that they were uh, natural necessarily allies but they uh got they got together they formed some sort of partnership and they got a lot of mutually beneficial things done do you see uh this ending with that second uh latino age population district oh i have i think have, there's no question there's going to be that latino influence district you know this is a this this is a judgment you know, long term building the party base over time. You know, the progressives, they can not participate. They've got really got nowhere to go. Uh, where the Latino, Hispanic, broadly defined, you know, where that growing group, and that's a very fast growing demographic, where that sits within American politics is up for grabs. And so this is a judgment at one level that the future of the party, for the future of the party, we need to be diversifying, we need to bring Hispanic voters, you know, into, into the party. And if we have to make trade-offs between uh, making some of the uh, more progressive voters or a particularly a particular uh, you know member of Congress unhappy, you know that's the trade-off we're willing we're willing to make. So it's about this election, but it's also about you know what happens over the decade and where that that group of very fast-growing uh, you know voters uh, are going in terms of their political identity. So, uh, but it does you know the the yeah the, the Democrats really don't want to make anybody unhappy, uh, but. Uh, someone's going to be unhappy short term and long term, uh, and so that looks like this is where they're putting their votes. You know, putting you know their, and so I would be surprised if we didn't have, you know, I mean the rumbling now is about we want a uh, a full uh, you know Latino district. Well, you know the the percentage of voting age population uh, of Garcia's district. There are more, the percentage of Hispanics are much higher than the percentage of African-Americans in any of the other three 
uh, districts that are currently represented or will be represented by uh, uh, you know African American congressmen. So uh, you know we'll see how much of this is real and how much of this is just you know trying to leverage the best deal you can get. It would be foolish to have us to, to have this break down and have it end up in the federal courts. So. Sure. Uh, yeah, you know, I, 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 I think that that we'll get something that looks like the current map, and I, and I, you know, we may not get it before January, and and that's you know that's risky. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we have ten minutes uh, remaining. I want to break down a couple of things that Democrats did uh, push through this week, uh, John. You know, for years. Uh, since 1995, at least, uh, but really, uh, you know, more than a decade before that, uh, there has been this fight over what's called the parent, uh, Illinois Parental Notice of Abortion Act, which um, requires that minors or teens, they, uh, their parents or guardians are notified before they get an abortion. Um, this has been on Illinois' books uh, 1983. There was uh, an attempt never enforced because uh, of years of court battles, 1995 law, again, never enforced until 2013. Uh, but uh, pro-choice activists have been, you know, this has been in their crosshairs ever since, and especially in the last five years, as uh, you know, progressives seek to uh, kind of make Illinois a safe haven for those who would, you know, come to the state or, you know, in-state residents who uh, want to terminate their pregnancy. So, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about the uh, the dynamics uh, at play when, uh, you know, we're talking about, it's not just, it's not an issue that falls neatly on where where someone might expect the, the usual dividing lines on abortion are. It, you know, so how how difficult was this for, say, a, a moderate Democrat to either vote no or uh, take a walk on that bill? It's a, interesting. We were talking about the, the a couple of weeks ago. We we wondered what was going to happen in the veto session, other than the congressional map. And this is an example of of um, uh, maybe too much time on their hands in, in terms of uh, this wouldn't have come up now because it is so um, contentious. Uh, and, and, I, and I was predicting that no, the veto session is too short a time to, to, um, to whip the votes to get this done. But it is um, uh, uh, an issue that, uh, is, that progressives see as a, a, a matter of stopping abortions, keeping abortions, because when you have to notify, when the abortion facility has to notify a parent or guardian, progressives say, that delays the procedure, and and it and it will you know put another block in the in the step toward um, uh, a minor's um, constitutional right to to an abortion, and um, but it it is um, but moderate moderates see it as pretty innocuous. Um, it it requires forty eight hours notice, not consent, as they want to point out that parents don't need to consent, but but. Republicans say parents have a right to know, you know, they 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 uh, have to give consent for a school field trip for a kid to get a, an aspirin in school. Why can't they at least know that their minor child is is undergoing an abortion? Um, the, the the other side of that is that many children are in abusive relationships or abusive environments, and it would cause them danger or harm to notify the parents that the law includes a judicial bypass. If I don't feel comfortable having my parents notified, I can go to a judge. Well, that's only happened. The, the, the judge intervention has only happened 500 times. Um, and only once has an abortion been denied by a, a pro, a pro-life judge. Um, so it seems to be a situation where Democrats are Democrats know their power in Illinois and they see their role as one of, you know, it's not so much about parental notification. It's about abortion period in, in America. We have in Texas a year, uh, a month ago, a law took a, a effect, the heartbeat law that virtually bans abortions. We have a Mississippi law going to the Supreme court 
that bans most abortions after uh, 15 weeks. The Texas law is six weeks. So um, the progressives in Illinois feel threatened. They feel like this is their opportunity to say, Illinois is still a safe haven for abortions. This Illinois is still um, very much in favor of abortion rights and um, women and uh, you know having having the right to choose. They so I, I think it's more of a uh, uh, less about the issue itself and more about um, uh, abortion. You know, less about parental notification, and more about the bigger issue of abortion in America. Sure. I mean, you know, uh, yes, this is a very nuanced law, very nuanced uh, situation. But in the end, um, you know, it, it seems as if uh, progressives um, political calculation is that uh, eventually this will fit into the entire kind of arc that is about abortion access and not necessarily about the uh, the nuances of uh, parental notification uh, once all the details have blown over. But I uh, can't, you know, the other interesting thing that we saw this week was this fight over another kind of decades old law that also has to do with abortion in the wake of uh, Roe v. Wade in the late 1970s. Um, you know, lawmakers, they adopted um, you know, things to react to legalizing abortion, including the Health Care Right of Conscience Act. Uh, you know, all states have some sort of uh, version of this, uh, which, you know, shields uh, medical uh, health care professionals who say, I'm a Catholic doctor and I have a, a religious objection to performing abortions. I will not be forced in my practice to perform an abortion. Um, but in the last couple of months, some uh, creative law lawyering has led to a brand new reading of that Health Care Right of Conscience Act saying that, um, you know, I shouldn't as a teacher or an, uh, a nurse at a hospital, like all kinds of employers, the, the legal bounds are still being tested, but it's had some success in, uh, for those who uh, don't want to comply with their employer's uh, vaccine mandate for COVID. And uh, there's been some success, and definitely the uh, Governor Jamie Pritzker's office uh, and Attorney General Paul Mayroll are nervous about this. And so an amendment to that decades-old law um, has been uh, in the works this week, but it's been really interesting to see um, the, the breakdown of you know, people are just not willing to go for this at this time, especially moderate Democrats, again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we got, you know, we put more than 60 votes on repealing parental notification. Uh, in that case, it was all was left. I mean, the right to conscience is passed in 78, the parental notification in 1995. Uh, and at that point, you had a whole laundry list of things that the reproductive rights uh, groups wanted, uh, the pro-choice groups wanted. Uh, when now we're reacting to Texas, oh, well, how can we signal we're even stronger in Illinois? There's nothing left to do except appeal, repeal parental notification. In this case, with the right to conscience, you've got something that was designed narrowly for medical professionals, nurses, doctors, anesthesiologists, not to participate in, in things that they felt violated their religious conscience. That now bleeds over into pandemic politics. Uh, and we still get a 60 vote majority with a lot of regionalism in it uh, that has to do with, you know, down moderate Democrats, but it really reflects the change in the cultural changes and the political changes in Illinois, that uh, there are, you know, what was the state in 1978, uh, you know, easily passed the religious freedom conscious. In 95, we got parental notification and a Republican governor, Republican legislature. Now, under a Republican governor, Bruce Rauner, we pay, you know, he signed a whole bunch of changes. And now we come to today or last night and, you know, we've got a solid majority uh, 
to assert that we are a very progressive pro-choice state. It's it's stunning in terms of uh, the change that's taken place in Illinois politically and culturally over the last 40 years. Sure. And, uh, you know, the as we sit here filming this Thursday morning, the House has passed that, but it's kind of a watered down version and Democrats seem that they want to come back and take another bite at the apple in January when it would have a more, uh, you know, immediate effective date. But we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank our guests, uh, Kat Redfield, John O'Connor. I'm Hannah Meisel. Thanks for joining us on Capitol View, and we'll see you again next time.